Welcome to the Catalyst Sale Podcast. Whether you are a sales professional, not in sales, but interested in helping people solve problems, or a founder CEO who is looking to grow your business, you'll find practical tools, stories, and experience you can apply to your role. I'm your host, Jody Mayberry, and I'm here with Mike Simmons, co-founder of Catalyst Sale. Hello, Mike. Hey, Jody. Mike, this is going to be such a good episode. I'm excited of who we're going to talk to. We've got Bo Burlingham, author of Finish Big, author of Small Giants, co-author of The Big Game of Business. He writes a column in Inc. My goodness, he's got a lot going on. He has got a lot going on. Well, Bo, I'm so glad you were able to join us. Welcome to Catalyst Sale. Good to be here, Jody. Bo, it's awesome to have you on the podcast. Thanks for, for being able to make it. I was introduced to you through Small Giants. It had been a book that was on my list of books to read for a while. And I finally got to it a little bit earlier, uh, actually just a couple of months ago. And as I finished it up, I sent a direct tweet to you and you responded back and one thing led to another and, and here we are. So thanks for, thanks for being on the show. Sure. My, it's my pleasure. So Small Giants, what inspired you to do the research and pull the book together? Can you give the audience some context there? Well, yes, it was actually, it all began with Zingham. I had been hearing, I, I was at Inc. I mean, I've been, I lived, I worked at Inc. for over 30 years and I had heard about Zingerman's in, you know, let's say going back to the uh, 1990s. And I finally persuaded my editor to uh, let me go out and do an article on Zingerman. And I was really just extremely impressed with, uh, company. And, you know, there were many things that I found fascinating about it. But one of the most fascinating had to do with the uh, kind of people that they were able to attract to this business. I mean, they were at that point, they're still pretty small in the whole world of business, but uh, they were at that point, I don't know, about, I guess, 10 or $12 million. And, you know, they had people working there who had had big, well-paying jobs and large companies and had taken significant compensation, lower compensation in order to come be part of what was going on at Zingerman's. Mm -hmm. it, it had a, the company had a quality that I had seen in the early days of Inc. and a lot of companies that I got to know there, what I call mojo in the book, which to me is the business equivalent of charisma. Basically, when a leader has charisma, you want to be, you want to follow him or her. When a business has mojo, you want to be associated with that business. You want to buy from it. You want to sell to it. You want to work for it. You want to wear its t-shirts and caps and so forth. And uh, Zingerman's had that. And so I, I wrote an article about it for Inc. And it was a cover story in uh, 2003. It was called The Coolest Small Company in America. And I... You know, I wrote the article and I, I was very, it got a very big response from our readers. And one of the people who responded to it was a publisher in New York. And he got in touch with me and said that he really liked the article. And he wondered if there were other companies, if there wasn't a book there. And I said, I didn't understand what he was talking about. I thought, gee, there might well be a book for Ari Weinzweig and Paul Saginaw, who were the founders of Zingerman's, but I didn't uh -huh. see where there was a book for me. But I agreed to go meet with him. And he said, no, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, is there a book about, I mean, Zingerman's is a company that could have gotten a lot bigger, a lot faster. And it chose not to because it had other goals. Founders had other goals that they considered more important than getting as big as possible, as fast as possible. And he said, I wonder if there are other companies out there that are that are like that. And I've been at Inc. for, at that point, for 20, more than 20 years. And I didn't know the answer to the question, but I thought it was a very, very good question. So I basically, we worked things out and I set out to find, to answer the question, are there other companies like this who had the opportunity to get a lot bigger, a lot faster, but chose not to? And I talked to everybody I knew and I you know, I looked through back issues of Inc. and other magazines. And one of the first things I realized was that there were a lot more of these companies out there than I ever imagined. 
And they were, in fact, all in every part of the country and in almost every industry or business segment that you could identify. And so I, I had the luxury of choosing the companies that I thought would allow me to explore this phenomenon. Mm-hmm. And so I looked at them, I went out and started researching them, and, and they all had this quality. Again, I didn't have the term for it back then, but this quality that I call mojo. Yep. And the question I had was, well, where does it come from? And how do they hold on to it? What do they do that's different from other companies in order to have this sort of very special quality? And that was really the genesis of Small Giants. And you know, there were a number of these companies that you covered all, or some of, some of them, well, actually, I would say that many people in our audience would be familiar with each of them and might have their own individual story around them. I have a story around Zingerman's in that I had a couple of cousins who both went to school in Ann Arbor, and I'm a big Michigan fan. Go Blue. The, I, I don't know what I'll do if a Michigan and ASU ever play each other in a big game when I'm now that I've gone to ASU. I know it's happened in the past, but Cliff Bars is in there, Anchor Brewing Company. And I mean, I remember you, you would drink Anchor Steam beer, and it was there was like this cult following around people who were passionate about the brand. And this gets to that, that piece about what drives it. What's the thing behind it? So we get into this mojo piece. Can you talk a bit about mojo, how companies, how it starts to come together? And then where, not to put too, too many questions in the same category here, but how it comes together and where companies lose it, like when it, when it disappears? Well, it's interesting because in fact, I was first aware of this quality. I started working at Inc. in the early 1980s, Mm -hmm. a very exciting time in business, although we felt that we were the only ones who were looking at it because most of the other business publications were focused on the Japanese or the Germans and and that sort of competition, whereas we were looking at these, these entrepreneurial companies that were up and coming and that we could see represented the real competition to large American companies over the long run. And a lot of the, I got to know a lot of these companies uh, and their leaders when they were still pretty young. And I'm, you know, I'm talking about Steve Jobs at Apple and uh, Bill Gates at Microsoft and Yvonne Chouinard at Patagonia and Ben Cohen and Jerry Greenfield at Ben and & Jerry's and so forth. Mm-hmm. And those companies, they had that quality. It was a special quality. I didn't have a name for it. But it was a special quality that you could sense when you went in and spent any time, talked to their customers, talked to their employees, spent any time around those companies. They had it. Most of them lost it when they got larger. These companies hadn't lost it. They still had it. And, you know, my question was, well, where does it come from? And I decided to answer that question by looking at what these companies had in common. And I came up with uh, six characteristics. Mm -hmm. One of them was that these were all companies that were run by people and started by people who had a very clear idea of who they were, what they wanted, and why. The fact is they couldn't have made the decisions they did if they didn't know that. You know, to take Zingerman's as an example, you know, they got to a point after 10 years where they had they had started this delicatessen, which by then was by 1992 was world famous, and a lot of people were telling them you're crazy if you don't franchise this and take it out to other college towns around the country. But the founders, Paul Saginaw and Ari Weinzweig, decided they didn't want to do that. Mm-hmm. I mean, Ari was not interested in uh, sort of flying around the country and checking up on. Zingerman's to see whether or not the coleslaw was fresh. So they said, well, we've got to do something. And so they talked about it for a couple of years. And then they came out in 1994 with a vision of where they wanted to be 15 years in the future. Okay. And they decided, look, we're not just going to be a delicatessen anymore. We're going to be a whole collection of companies. All of them are going to be food related. And they're all going to be in the Ann Arbor area. And we want each of them to be great and unique, different from other companies out there. 
And we're going to have like 10 or 15 of them in 15 years. And that was a pretty bold vision of where they wanted to go. And in fact, by the time I went to visit them in 2002, they were well over halfway there. Uh I mean, you know, today there's a there's in addition to Zingerman's Delicatessen, which is famous. There was also uh, Zingerman's Bakehouse, which is a world class bakery. There's a Zingerman's Coffee Company. There's Zingerman's Candy Company. There's a Zingerman's Roadhouse, which is a great restaurant in town. There, oh, there's Zingerman's Mail Order, which is where you get your brownies from. And there, you know, there are a lot. Of, there are all these different companies, Zingerman's Catering, and so forth. And they're all food related. And each of them strives to be great and unique in its own right. Yep. So, but, you know, in order to make the decision to do that, Paul Saginaw and Ari Weinzweig really had to go against a lot of advice that they were getting mm-hmm. and a lot of what people were telling them that they were crazy to pass up this other opportunity. But they decided this is what they wanted to do. And Frankly, if they hadn't known who they were, what they wanted, and why, they wouldn't have been able to make that decision. You know, the same is true of uh, Gary Erickson at Cliff Bar, who yep. agreed to sell his company, you know, for $120 million. He had a co founder, so it would have been $60 million each. And at the last minute, he decided to walk away from the deal because it wasn't what he wanted to do. It wasn't the kind of company that he wanted to have. And so, you know, and, and if you go through all the companies that I have in the book, each of each of the leaders were making comparable decisions. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second quality had to do with the relationship that they had to the communities in which they were located. They really sort of reflected the communities. It wasn't just they gave back a lot to their communities, which they all did, but it was also the, the, the community sort of shaped their personality. I mean, you look at Anchor Brewing, for example. Anchor Brewing is a San Francisco landmark. Mm-hmm. It started during the gold rush. It had been through all the earthquakes and fires in San Francisco history. And, you know, today it's, it's a company that people who come to uh, San Francisco, they want to see the Golden Gate Bridge, and they want to go to Anchor Brewing, which isn't a bad idea because you get a lot of beer while you're there. And again, so that was the second quality. The yep. third quality had to do with the relationship that they had to their customers and their suppliers, which what struck me about it was how personal it was. Yep. In other words, they really strove to establish one-on-one relationships with customers and suppliers, even if they had you know thousands and thousands of them. They went out of their way to, as much as possible, create a one-on-one relationship. And yet, oddly enough, the customers, in most cases, didn't come first, they came second, because the employees came first. You know, which is, when you think about it, you know, once a company gets above a certain size, it's not the founder or the CEO who's relating to the customers and the suppliers, it's people who work in the company. And so, if you don't, if they don't have the same sort of passion for what the company does that that the leaders do, they're not going to give the the great customer service or they're not going to deal with their suppliers in a great way. That was the, uh, I guess I'm up to the fourth quality. And then the fifth quality really is one that I missed originally in the book, but I discovered afterwards. I had certain criteria that I used to select these companies. And one of them was that I wanted companies that had been profitable for at least 15 or 20 years and had been through all the ups and downs of business, mm-hmm. but it still maintained, you know, this profitability. And I, you know, I figured, okay, well, so that, that, that covers the financial thing. Well, I was wrong because almost as soon as the book came out, a couple of these companies began to get into trouble. And I realized that I'd missed something. Sure. So, so in the, in the, 20th anniversary of, or was it 20th? No, 10th anniversary. Ten, yep. The 10th anniversary of the book, I included another chapter, which is basically called How Small Giants Die. And it was really looked at the kind of factors 
that you have to be aware of if you're going to do all these other wonderful things. And, you know, there were three in particular that I focused on. One, you need to focus on your gross margins mm-hmm. which, and because it's very easy in the competitive world to get sucked into competing on price. And that, that can be deadly unless you're set up to do that. I mean, some companies are set up to do that, but for a small giant, that, that wasn't it. And then the other was that you need to have a healthy balance sheet, meaning that you need to have enough cash so that you can, you know, you need to have the right relationship between your payables and your receivables, yep. or that can put you out of business. And, and, you know, the third was that you need to have a business model that, and you need to, you know, times change environments change and you need to be aware of how the environment is changing and it may be that your business model has to change and if you don't change with the times you could go out of business that way and then the last quality in other words the last quality where i thought the mojo came from mm-hmm. had to do with how the leaders and by extension the other people in the company felt about whatever it was that their companies did. In other words, not just the brand, but what it was that the companies were delivering to customers. Mm -hmm. And they were totally crazy about it. I mean, it was like, you know, when you ask them about it, they would, they'd rhapsodize about whatever it was. I mean, even Norm Brodsky, who was, uh, you know, who I write this column with in Inc., he, you know, he had a record storage business. Well, in record storage, what do you do? You put boxes on shelves and you take right. boxes off shelves. Well, how do you get passionate about putting boxes on shelves? You talk to Norman, he was totally passionate about it. He said he loved nothing better than to walk into his warehouses and smell the cardboard. And in fact, he was passionate. He was passionate about having a great place to work. He was passionate about giving great, great service to his customers. He was passionate about his community and being a very positive part of the community. And he was passionate about having a great life, which is also part of this. So those were really the six characteristics that I found that were crucial in terms of creating this mojo and maintaining the mojo. That if you know things change when a company grows, I mean, a company gets to a certain size and it, it can no longer operate. It's just not possible. Right. Really to operate the same way it did when it was smaller. And that's okay. I'm not critical of that, but it's just simply a fact of life. I mean, Whole Foods, when it got to be very big, was a different company than it was when it was a small giant in Austin, Texas. And, you know, there are things that change. There there are things that if you want to have these qualities, these other qualities, They have to be your goal, not size. In other words, size is a fine thing. If that's what you want to do, if you want to build a big company, more power to you if you can pull it off. But you have to understand that things are going to change. The way you run the business is going to change. And what you're going to be able, all these things, all these factors, your relationship to your employees, you know, when a company is a size where you can know all of your employees and they can know you, it's one thing. It's another thing when you get to a size where the people at the bottom really have no relationship to the people at the top or vice versa. That's a totally different thing. And, you know, the relationship that you have to customers changes as you get larger. It has to change. Yep. Uh, and that's fine. But the thing I wanted the readers of Small Giants to understand is they have a choice and they should make it consciously. Yep. In other words, it's if they wanted, if what they were passionate about was building a really big company. Okay, that's fine. But there was nothing in business that requires them to do that. They could have a very successful, in fact, they could, they could set the standard in their industry and still be a relatively small company. Yeah. And what I really like about a lot of the stuff that you pull together in all of that, and thanks for the, for the background, is the simple questions that need to be asked up front. And those simple questions that you need to continue to ask through the process to make sure that you are either staying within that spectrum that you're focused toward, or 
if you need to move the light a little bit to the left or the right, or the spotlight to the left or the right, and things are changing in the business, you've got the ability to adjust and adapt and, and iterate. And, and it just gets back. You don't have to overcomplicate it. You got to you know, why are we doing what, are we, what we're doing? Exactly. Who do we impact? How are they doing those things today? Why is this thing is imp- this important? Where does culture fit in to it? And when we bring employees into the organization, why do they care about the problem that our customers are experiencing or the thing that we're trying to trying to solve? And I just, I, it seems like over and over, we try to overcomplicate these things and look for some kind of quick fix or some kind of thing that's going to help the 10 steps to doing this better. And we struggle, we just struggle with the basics. So I think your book was a very good reminder of the basics. Well, it's true. And the reason we tend to adopt those sort of quick fixes that you're talking about is because most companies are so focused on getting as big as they can, as fast as they can. Yep. They don't pay attention to those things. It's it sort of almost an afterthought. I mean, or, or they pay attention to it, but they don't give it the kind of priority that that you can give when, in fact, you're not necessarily trying to get as big as possible, as fast as possible. So let's kind of shift here. Actually, I've got one more question about small giants before we shift to finish big. But you've got a community of people that have come together to talk about small giants. Can you talk a little bit about that and let people know where, where they can find information about that? This is actually something that happened after the book came out, which is, is that I began hearing from a lot of people who identified with the companies that I'd written about in the book. And a lot of people were telling me, you know, there's a great business opportunity here because these companies really want to, there's no way for us to be together or to know each other. You know, there's an opportunity to create some sort of entity that allows different companies that sort of share these values to be together. And one of the people who was telling me that was a very successful entrepreneur in Texas called Paul Spiegelman. And he had a great company called Barrel. That It was a call center, actually, but it was unlike any other call center you've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And I was down in Texas visiting him, and uh, we were having dinner. And he was sort of getting on my case and saying, you know, there's this great opportunity here. And I said, Paul, you know, you're right. I understand there is this opportunity here. What it needs is an entrepreneur. He said, I'm a journalist. I'm not an entrepreneur. Frankly, I don't think I'd be a very good entrepreneur. And it needs somebody who knows how to build an organization and frankly has the financial resources to be able to support it while you're going forward. And I said, you know, if that's something you want to do, I will support you. But somebody else has to take the lead on it. And he looked at me and said, do you really mean that? I said, absolutely. You want to go ahead and do it. I will support you. And so we wound up, Paul wound up really taking the lead in putting together what's now called the Small Giants community, which, you know, it has, there are lots of different things that the Small Giants community does. If if there are people out there who, in your audience, who would like to be in touch with other companies, other small giants, that's the best way to do it is to go to smallgiants.org, which is the website for the small giants community. And you'll see that there's, a, there's an annual summit. There are you know, various sort of forums online and local. There are courses that you can take or that you can send your actually your your people to if you have if you have a vision of your company and you want to really get your you know the next layer of leadership plugged into this whole idea of being a small giant there there's a there are courses there's a like a leadership academy that Paul and the uh, the general manager he hired a, a wonderful woman Named Hamza Daher, who is the, uh, you know, she's the managing, really basically the managing director of the Small Giants community. And Paul and Hamza have just done a fabulous job in terms of building this community. And, you know, I support them. <laughs> Mainly what I do is give them moral support since yeah. they're doing all the, all the work. But I'm very proud of 
what they've done and uh, very happy to be associated with it. Awesome. And we'll include a link in the show notes to the community and so that, so that everybody out there can, can go to it. Let's kind of shift gears here a little bit and go into the go into finish big. And you know, one of the patterns that we've seen in organizations that we've had a chance to work with, both companies that I've been a part of as I kind of grew up in my career, and and Mike, the co-founder of our company, has been a part of, but also organizations that we've seen that we work with who are either going through exits or have gone through an exit is extra tough. They usually take a lot longer than you anticipate. The agenda on the other side of the equation, the acquiring company, has a significant impact on whether or not the exit will be successful. And sometimes organizations struggle with evaluating what that agenda is. Can you talk to the, give the backstory on what compelled you to write Finish Big? And, and then we'll get into some of the details that popped up through your research for that book. Well, I'd be happy to, Mike. Uh, I have to say that when I started writing the book, I knew practically nothing about this subject because it was not a subject, even though I'd been at Inc. for you know many, many years, yep. it was not something we focused on. I think we focused on startups. We focused on growing a company. But it was like, okay, well, the exit, that's somewhere out in the future. We don't have to focus on that. And that I had a glimpse of that with a series of articles that uh, columns that I did with Norm Brodsky, who I mentioned yep. earlier, when he he was actually approached by a private equity firm in 2007 that wanted to acquire his business. And uh, he, you know, he had some conditions about what he wanted, if they were going to acquire the business, about what they had to acquire. And, and they seemed to be happy to uh, agree to those conditions. And so, you know, I was, we, we did this monthly column and uh, he came back from a conference and uh, I asked him, what should we write the column about? And he said, well, it looks like I'm going to sell the business. And I was shocked because he, he frankly loved his business so much. And I said, well, explain it to me. So he told me and I said, well, maybe we should write about that in the column. And he basically said, sure, why not? Well, we discovered that there are actually a couple of reasons why you probably don't want to write about intimately about what happens during the exit process. Sure. Uh, for one thing, it wasn't something that the acquirers, particularly or the would-be acquirers, particularly appreciated. You know, they to a point in, in a meeting and say, "Well, if I say this, is it going to appear in Inc. Magazine for thousands and thousands or millions of people to read?" And Norm said, "Yes, probably." Uh, And uh, so we wrote this. It became one column after the other because, in fact, you know, we wrote the first article about just his decision to move forward with this. And then it became a real time chronicle of what the process was like. And he was on the fence about whether or not he was really going to go through with this. At one point, we it developed a big following people who were really very curious to read about this. And At one point, Norm asked people for advice about should he go through with this? And we got hundreds of emails from people who basically said, yes, Norm. Most of them said, yes, Norm, go go through with it. And uh, eventually he decided that he was, in fact, going to go through with it. And uh, by that point, that was big news. So the editor of Inc. at that point decided it was such big news that she was going to make it a cover story. Awesome. So this cover story came out saying, you know, Norm decides to sell. And, you know, right after that, we had another column to write after that. So I called him up and I thought we'd write about the closing. And uh, I called him up and uh, he said, uh, guess what? I said, what? He said, well, I decided not to sell. And I, I was shocked. Yeah. And I, I said, what do you mean you decided not to? So we just ha- put out an issue. You know, it's a cover. It's a cover story of you saying you've decided to sell. Now you decided not to sell. He said, "Well, I found something out that I didn't know, which was that the key decision maker in this private equity group yep. was somebody, the person I trusted least. Yeah. And the group had made a lot of promises in terms of, particularly how they were going to treat my employees after the sale. And uh, 
I suddenly realized that I couldn't necessarily count on them to do that. So he backed out of the sale and eventually he did sell a majority stake, but we didn't write about that. We didn't write about that as it was going on. We wrote about it afterwards. And from this experience, I saw that there was this tremendous curiosity that people had about, well, what is it actually like to go through this? I went to my publisher and I sort of told them all this. And I said, maybe there's a book there. And the publisher said, I think that's a great idea for a book. You know, why don't you do that book next? So I said, fine, I'll do that one next. Yep. And I immediately realized that I had a big problem, which was I didn't know anything about the subject, about, you know, exits, and except what I'd been through with Norm. So I, I decided that the first thing I had to do was I had to educate myself. So I went out and I started interviewing, talking to business owners who had been through the process. And I think the most and I, you know, I wound up talking to, I don't know, somewhere between 100 and 150. And uh, one of the things that really surprised me when I started doing this was that a tremendously high percentage of them, I would say at the time I thought it was about 50%, of, subsequently been told it's more like 70% of the people who I talked to were very unhappy and, and wish they hadn't done it and were filled with regrets and, uh, you know, didn't know what to do. They were, and I said, well, okay, well, then that's got to be the book I write. What's the difference between the ones who do it successfully and the ones who don't? And, uh, you know, that's fed into exactly what you just talked about, Mike. Yeah. And you shared some story, like, I mean, stories of depression and death and suicide you know, uh, related to instances where, the founder or the CEO or the person who had helped with the exit who didn't have that plan after the fact. They didn't know that fourth stage that you talk about in the book about the importance of knowing what happens after the fact. You know, that point where, wow, and I know some of these are older, could go back older stories where it's nobody's hitting me up on my pager or nobody is sending me an email or nobody needs me today. And you know, it's it uh, we're getting pretty close. We've got a couple of kids. We've got a, a kid who's a sophomore in high school and one who's in seventh grade. It's you know, we're only a number of years before they exit the house, and right. you start to think now you get into the empty nest component. And you know, one of the things we try to correlate, or I try to weave through in in the podcast episodes, is how the we are per, we're humans. Our personal experiences apply in the context of the work that we do and the jobs that we have. And we may not actually do the same job. So as a journalist, you're not a salesperson, but you really are in the way that you're researching and gathering information and trying to draw information out of the person that you're, whose story you're trying to tell. And I know we didn't originally plan to go this route, but I'm going to ask a, a question about getting information out of folks. And, and I don't mean it in a manipulative way. I mean it in a getting to the root of the story approach. When do you know if you've asked enough questions to get to the, get to the root of the story or get to the base? I have a deal because this could be, I, I realized going in that this could be a very sensitive topic for a lot of people. And so I had an understanding with everybody I interviewed that I would talk to him and it would all be off the record. Okay. Yep. If, if I wanted to use it, I would have to come back to them and get their permission. So everybody understood that nothing was going to appear in print without their saying it was okay. And that way I could have you know frank conversations with people. And if there were things that they were that were sensitive to them or that they didn't want to have published, they're protected. In fact, what wound up happening was that people turned out to be willing to say a lot more than you might expect. And they they were willing to really talk about things that, you know, might be a little embarrassing or something like that, but they were willing to do it. And the reason was that there was only one reason that they would do that. And that is to help other people. Yep. And, you know, there, there were a couple of people who basically said, no, I can't have this story out there, in which case I respected that. I didn't use their story. Yep. But for other people, basically, 
and I really, really appreciated this, and I told them so. They were willing to have me write about mistakes that they made, which came back to really haunt them. And uh, so there, there are a lot of stories, as you mentioned, Mike, there are stories in the book that really, really sort of convey how people wind up making mistakes that lead them ultimately to have a bad exit. I mean, I had to, obviously I had to define what a good exit was. Yep. And I defined, and basically I came up with four or five criteria. I mean, number one, that people could look back on the process and feel that it was a good process of selling and that uh, they had been fairly appropriately rewarded for what they had put into it. Second was that people could look back on what they had done as an entrepreneur or as a business owner to create something of value in the world. And they could look back on pride, with pride, on what they had done. The third was that they, that they could feel good about what had happened to the other people who had been on the journey with them. And, you know, that's going to be a different, different for different people. But yep. uh, they didn't basically, if they were sensitive people and the other people who'd been on the journey with them, they got their money and everybody else got screwed. That was going to put a real damper on how they felt about the whole process. And, you know, finally, for some people, although not for everybody, but for some people, the final criteria, a criterion for a good exit was that the business was continuing to go on and was doing better than ever. Yep. And, uh, and they could take pride in the fact that they had managed what is certainly the biggest transition that every business has to go through, which is the change in ownership. So basically, a bad exit was missing one of those things. Mm -hmm. If you felt that the process you'd gone through was awful, you'd been screwed, you're, you're going to not feel good about the exit. If it gets in the way where you really have a bitter feeling about the whole thing, you're not going to have a good exit. If your people get screwed afterwards, you're not going to have a good exit. So basically, that was the difference between a good exit and a bad exit. Why do you think that people want to do this on their own? Like, why do you think they don't go for outside help or they try to do it on their own? Well, we're talking about entrepreneurs here. <laughs> and entrepreneurs like to feel that they like to be in control and they like to feel that, you know, they can handle anything. What they don't realize in going into this is that managing an exit is a, something that they have no experience with, that all their experience in running the company is irrelevant. And in fact, the danger is, one of the dangers is, is that it's really a full-time job to manage the exit. And the mistake a lot of people make is that they take on that full-time job, which means they're not doing their other full-time job yep. to run the company. And the result is, is that performance of the company goes down, and that's going to affect the sale and so forth. And a lot of people have to sort of figure that out the hard way, which is to, is to go through it. They'll try and do it themselves. It won't work out well. They'll make lots and lots of mistakes. And, uh, you know, the, there'll be a bad effect of it all. Now, I will say this, that some of the best people to get to help you on an exit are people who've done that, who've made all the mistakes and who realize, you know, who, who have actually been through it themselves. And they understand the mistakes that they made and the mistakes you can make. And so I'm very highly recommend being having someone as your exit advisor who's been through it himself because the chances are they'll understand things. I mean, you know, the problem with, you know, you mentioned, I mean, I have to say that I learned more from writing this book than practically anything else. I mean, it forced me to change a lot of ideas I had. You know, I used to think that entrepreneurship was all about building companies, right? That's what we would call them company builders. And I realized that that was, in fact, the wrong way to look at it, that entrepreneurship is not, it's not a construction project. The end of the process is not that you build a great company. That's the middle of the process. Yeah. 
it's really a journey that you go on. And yes, one thing you want to do in this journey is build a great company. But the journey doesn't end with that. The journey only ends when you leave that company. And everybody leaves sooner or later. You may go out feet first, but you're going to leave sooner or later. And frankly, if you don't prepare, even if you decide to, uh, to stay until, until, frankly, you're being wheeled out in the gurney, <laughs> you still have to prepare for that because otherwise what you're going to do is you're going to leave a huge mess for the people you care about most in the world, namely your family, yep. your employees, everybody else, everybody who you've tried to serve while you've been building this business is going to be you know, left in a terrible situation. So you've, you've got to, you got to, no matter what exit you prefer, you've got to prepare for it. You've got to go for it. So that was a big revelation to me. I, I never realized that. And I always thought that an exit was just, you know, an exit was just something that happened at the end of the process, you know. And, uh, and I realized that, again, that also was the wrong idea. That, in fact, an exit isn't an event. An exit is a stage of the business. And there's okay. four distinct phases to that stage of the business. The first one is what I call, it's the stage one is really sort of an educational one. It's where you sort of educate yourself about what the different options are and get some idea of what it is that you want to do. Yep. The second stage is what I call the strategic phase. And this is something everybody has to do, which is, the only difference is some people do it knowing what they're doing, and some people do it not knowing what they're doing. <laughs> and the people who know what they're doing realize that they are, in fact, building into their company the kind of qualities that are going to allow them to have the exit that they eventually want to have. And then the third phase is what most people think of as the exit. That's when you call up an investment banker, you call up your lawyer, you call up your accountant and say, okay, I'm ready to sell. And that is that takes a long time too, but although people, as you mentioned, like aren't really aware, but when you get into that phase, you know, that phase ends when you do a deal. As far as the investment banker goes or your lawyer, your accountant, that's the end of it. But it's not the end for the owner. Nope. For the owner, that's just the beginning the, the deal itself, just beginning of the final phase which is the transition from being an owner to being whatever comes next. Yeah. And almost nobody, very few people are prepared for that when it happens because there are a lot of things that people get out of running a company, having a company, that they don't realize until they don't have them anymore. One is their sense of identity. You know, you go to a party and somebody says, what do you do? You tell them. You tell them about the company you run. Afterwards, and you've sold your company, that's like the worst question you can get is, what do you do? You know, you're, that's, that's also your sense of purpose. In yeah. other words, you know, when you run a business, you sort of know what you're doing and you know where you're going with it. And you have a sense of purpose. You sold the company. Suddenly you don't have that anymore. It's your whole tribe. It's the people you go and see every day. And right. people who, you know, who respect you and, and want to talk to you and want to know what you think. Suddenly, they're all gone. You don't have them anymore. It's also one thing about business is the business, it sort of tells you what is the next thing you have to do. So it gives you structure in your life. The business tells you, what if you suddenly don't have that structure? In other words, you wake up in the morning, you can do anything you damn please. That can be very disorienting. And, you know, finally, you get a sense of progression in the business. In other words, you can sort of see where you're going. And you can sort of measure it. Well, suddenly you lose that. I mean, losing all these things at once is extremely disoriented. And it's very tough. It's a very tough transition, I think, for everyone to make. Mm -hmm. um, a little easy. If you're a serial entrepreneur, and basically your life is building one company after another, it's a different experience. But, you know, most people aren't serial entrepreneurs. Most people are. You know, they've started a company. And, you know, when you think about it, this is the most important thing you're going to do. You know, we, 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 there's all this stuff. You go on Google and you look up starting a business. You know, you'll get a billion 
hits or something. You look up exiting a business, you'll get a couple hundred thousand. But which is odd in that, you know, if you start a business and you fail, what do you do? You take the lessons and you go ahead and do it again. Right. Spent 20 years building a company and then you exit. And that is a failure. It is a tragedy. You know, it's not like you can go back and do it over again. Right. So it's very, very important to understand the stakes and to really have this understanding really from the beginning. You know, people ask, when should you start thinking about this? When should you start phase one? Yep. Where you're educating yourself. And I said, you can start phase one as soon as you start the business or before you start the business, because you have to understand that it's going to be a journey. And that the journey isn't going to end until you leave the business. And so if you understand that you're about to embark on a journey, you think about it a little differently than if you're just thinking about, I'm starting a company, I'm going to build a company. Yeah. You think the that planning piece is is really important. And that, you know, for people who've listened to the podcast for a while, they know how important what we how we focus on planning. I think the piece that really resonated for me. And I know this is something that we've talked about in the past, but really resonated with me is don't fail alone. Don't think that you're the only one who's going through this thing. Don't think that your business is so unique that others won't be able to understand it. The patterns repeat. The patterns are foundational. They're fundamental. They're things that others have experienced. And if you're not leveraging the experience, either in your network or through other sources, you're missing an opportunity and you're increasing your potential risk for failure in any number of the areas that Bo has uh, described. You're absolutely right. You know, that is crucial. Totally agree with you about that. So Bo, I've got, I've got a question for you as we kind of wrap things up here. And this is going to get back into your journalist, you being a journalist. Yeah. And one of the things I really like about what you described both with the a Small Giants book and the Finished Big book is in both instances, you really didn't know. Like you didn't know what you were going to see on the other side of the door when you walked through or as you started this path. But you had this process that you knew you had to go through in order to at least get things moving along. And one of the things that you had highlighted in both was the importance of research. How do you get yourself into the mindset or what is research? Actually, let me ask a better question here. What does research mean to you? Research means the book starts with a question. Yep. Both of those books started with a question, namely, well, with Finish Big, it was what's the difference between a good exit and a bad exit? What are the, the things that people who have a good exit do that people who have a bad exit don't? With Small Giants, it was really what are the qualities? of companies that make a decision, a conscious decision, that they're going to be the best at what they do, which was one of the criteria that I used. And frankly, there is acceptance among in the industry that they are one of the best at what they do. Yep. But, you know, they're not trying to get as big as possible, as fast as possible. What, what are actually the qualities that those companies have? So... That was the question. Now, the question, once I have the question, then I know how to do the research. Because the question is, how do I answer that question? Yep. What do I need to know to answer that question? Yep. So that's really the answer to your question, which is, if you want, in terms of doing the research, the most important thing is to know what is the question that you're trying to answer for your readers. In other words, why would a reader, I mean, I, I happen to be a very slow reader myself. Okay. And a lot of times when I read, one of the questions I have is, why are they telling me this? Why is somebody telling me this? If yeah. I don't have an answer to that question, I get very bored with, sure. the, with the topic. I have to sort of know what the answer to that question is. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously, if you're reading fiction, it's a little different than if you're reading nonfiction. But it's still, it's, you know, it's still the, the question is, I'm going to spend time reading this. Why am I reading it? What is this author trying to tell me? And why should I care about that? Yep. And uh, if you understand that view as a reader, you understand the responsibility of the author is to make sure you know the answer to that question. 
And you also are conveying the idea that you, as you go along, you're answering it, that there are actually stages that you're going through to answer the question. Why should you read this? Why should you know about this? Awesome. And so I hope everybody got a key point or the key point for me out of that is whether you are writing a book or you're putting together a proposal or you're preparing for a sales call or you're delivering a presentation, you need to be able to answer those fundamental questions. And if you can't answer those questions and you don't know the journey that you want people to go along, you've not, you don't have the right to be in front of the room. You don't have the right to ask that question. You don't have the right to take their time because they're trading their time with you as an expert there. And I know that's a, kind of a, there's some broad things that we covered, covered in that piece, but I, I, it's just that process. You can follow that process, that process of fa- saying, being very focused on the audience and it will help you be successful. Bo, I really enjoyed the conversation today. Is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience before we wrap up? Well, I'd like everybody in the audience to buy copies of my book. In fact, buy multiple copies and give them to friends. Aside from that, I have very much enjoyed the conversation, Mike. And uh, I would encourage people who are interested in Small Giants to go and uh, check out the Small Giants community. And I would say that about Finish Big, there is, it's very, I'm a big advocate of having peer groups of people who are being, understanding that the best advice you're going to get is going to come from people who've been through it themselves and people you can talk to about or who are planning to go through it themselves. There is the group that I mentioned in the book called Evolve. It's uh, EvolveUSA.org, I guess. And they're in Chicago. But groups like that, there are some other groups around the country that I'm aware of. and. Uh, if you can get in a group like that, where you're really surrounded by people who are sort of struggling with the same issues that you are, number one, you're going to learn a lot. Number two, you're going to develop very strong bonds with those people that are going to last long after you've done, you know, you've done the deal and you've moved on. Because these are some of the most intimate, personal, really deep personal questions that people can struggle with and to be able to talk to people who are in a similar situation there's nobody else in the world who's in a similar situation except people who are facing this challenge of exiting the business to be able to be in a group with people like that that really leads to long-lasting friendship awesome we will include links to all of the things that we've discussed on the podcast Oh, thank you very much for the time. I really appreciated this. It's my pleasure, Mike, and I really enjoyed it as well. Thank you very much. Bo, thank you so much. This was a great conversation. So thank you for joining us. And if you have found this conversation interesting and you would like to share it with a friend or colleague, please do so. Thank you again, Mike. And thank you for listening to the Catalyst Sale Podcast. Podcast.